Hello and uh, welcome everyone to the second day of Collective Practices to be Continued. My name is Inga, I'm one of the curators of Collective Practices and at Akut macht Neu. And I'm here to introduce today today's first session, Disobedient Chains of Care, Organizing Solidarity with Agricultural Workers, Live-in Carers and Migrants and Tenants. In this session, Valeria Graziano and Tomislav Medak of the initiative Pirate Care are bringing together um, activists from different contexts. We are very happy to have with us today Katalin Erdödi of the Saisonnierie campaign for the rights of harvest workers and Flavia Matei of the initiative DREPT representing the interests of 24-hour caretakers who will be also joined by Dora Bolva. And together we will address questions of collective organizing and organizing solidarity and that with a focus on the situation of migrant workers in agriculture and in the care sector. Um, in the first part of the session, Valeria and Tom will present Pirate Care, which is a transnational research project and network of activists, practitioners and scholars who stand against the criminalization of solidarity and for a common care infrastructure. They will also introduce our guests, Katalin and Flavia and Dora, and as well as their practices before then entering into the discussion in the second part of the session. And of course, we also invite all of you joining us today to actively take part in the session with your comments and with your questions. You can post these either to the chat in YouTube or Facebook, depending on wherever you're watching. And you can also post to our Collective Practices Telegram group. Um, you can find the link uh, in the chat section and also in the event descriptions. Yeah, so throughout the session, I will collect your questions and comments and we will bring them in after the presentations at the end of the session. Yeah, um, all right. And uh, with this short outline of disobedient chains of care, I hand over to you, Tom and Valeria, to kick off the conversation with our guests. Thank you, Inga. Uh, good afternoon to everyone uh, listening in. Uh, I would first like to thank Akud uh, Mahtnoi and Collective Practices. As I understand, this is the second day of uh, the sort of final program uh, in a series that you've been having throughout the last year. Um, and I hope uh, this session brings something to your debates. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Inga Zeidler, uh, Olga Wiedmann, and Ranef from Boiling Head Media, who is doing the magic in the background um, on, uh, on, on mine and Valeria's behalf, uh, particularly for the invitation uh, to Pirate Care uh, that we, we were happy to take on and uh, extend to practices we uh, uh, hold in admiration and are inspired by uh, and to have the opportunity to invite uh, people who will be presenting with us today. Um, first, I have to say that uh, we were planning for Anna Vilenica from um, the initiative Roof uh, from uh, Serbia and member of the Radical Housing Journal Collective to be with us today, but uh, unfortunately she has a concussion and could not uh, spend time at the screen before she recovers, uh, so we wish her uh, a quick uh, recovery. However, with us today, we have uh, two initiatives. Um, first one is Sezonieri. Uh, I'm really curious, how do you pronounce that? Kathleen will surely uh, say that uh, in from creation uh, point of view, I would, uh, pronounced that Sezonieri, but I don't know. Uh, Sezonieri is an activist-led campaign for the rights of agricultural workers in Austria that supports labor struggles in the area of migrant seasonal work, uh, and uh, it's developing these activities in collaboration with the trade union Pro Gay. Um, Sezonieri will be presented by Katon Erdedi, uh, who is an art worker and activist based in Vienna and Budapest, member of the Sazonieri since 2017. As an art worker and curator, she works across uh, many disciplines um, in the fields of visual and performing arts. 
Uh, and her most recent work investigates processes of rural exchange and post-socialist transformation through collaborative artistic and curatorial practice with a particular focus on Hungary. Alongside Sezonieri, uh, we'll have another uh, workers' rights initiative uh, from Austria called DREPT, uh, which is an interest group for live-in care workers. Uh, it's a self-organized uh, initiative uh, of, in particular, Romanian care workers uh, in the Austrian 24-7 care system, uh, which includes both activists, uh, supporters, and uh, caring, uh, um, live-in care workers. And DREPT will be presented by uh, Dora Bolfa, uh, who is a 24-7 live-in care worker from Romania. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she mobilized alongside other colleagues and actively supported her community in staying informed and facilitating access for Romanian care workers to state financial aids. Uh, she has joined the DREP team in the summer and has since uh, been an essential pillar in the organizational community work. And she will be presenting the work of DREP alongside Flavia Matei, who is an activist and one of the co-founders of DREPT. She dedicates her free time and resources in supporting Romanian caregivers in Austria and in their fight for fair working conditions. <clears throat> With me today on behalf of Pirate Care uh, presenting will be Valeria. Uh, Valeria, uh, myself and our third colleague, Marcel Mars, uh, we are all researchers at the Center for Post-Digital Cultures at the Coventry University, where we have in 2018 uh, convened uh, the project Pirate Care. Um, as Inga has already said, the, the objective of uh, the project is to map and connect collective practices of care that are emerging in response to the neoliberal crisis of care, uh, which is a term coined by Nancy Fraser. Um, so a little bit to define uh, the notion, the political notion of care, um, it would go something like this. Uh, throughout our lives, we depend on the so support of our kin, friends, strangers and institutions to sustain ourselves and also to sustain the world in which we and the future generations uh, have to live. That interdependency of humans and non-human nature in social and ecolo ecological reproduction defines the relations of care and the effort to sustain those relations defines the labor of care. Yet over the last couple of decades of financialized global capitalism, the convergence of processes uh, that include the rollout of workfare, rollback of reproductive rights, austerity measures, and criminalization of migration and solidarity have denied that vital support uh, to many. In response to that denial, which is making lives disposable, practices we have called pirate care are organizing to help migrants survive at sea and on land, provide pregnancy terminations where those are illegal, offer health support where institutions fail, self-organized childcare where public provision does not extend to everyone, and liberate, in our case, uh, knowledge where access is denied. Crucially, all these initiatives share a willingness to openly disobey laws and executive orders whenever these stand in the way of safety and solidarity and politicize that disobedience to contest the status quo. Uh, that disobedience and that politicization is what defines them as pirate care in our eyes. I'd like to ask Ranev to bring up the first slide, if possible. Okay, uh, okay, thank you. No, no, that's the second. No, that's the third. Ah, yeah, right, thank you. Oh, they are looping, <laughs> okay. Uh, so you should be seeing uh, the, the brown one, that one, yes. Our project specifically aims to activate collecting learning processes from uh, the knowledge of uh, these practices. In this, we have been inspired by the phenomenon of hashtags uh, syllabi, 
that is crowdsourced online syllabi created by social movements in response to situations of intense antagonism, such as Ferguson syllabus or hashtag Ferguson syllabus created in 2014 or gaming and feminism syllabus created in the same year, then in 2015, Trump 101 and Trump syllabus 2.0, or in 2016, Standing Rock syllabus, uh, which supports uh, indigenous uh, opposition to uh, the Keystone XL uh, pipeline. Um, we have written about this phenomenon of hashtag syllabi in our article, uh, Learning from Hashtag Syllabus. There, starting from uh, the analysis of this phenomenon, we have promised to develop a radical pedagogy approach that will help social justice initiatives write uh, online syllabi of their own, and to do so in a technological framework that would allow those syllabi, as well as the collections of texts that accompany them, to be collectively created, easily preserved in the long run, and maintained independent from the large digital platforms. As first such syllabus, uh, we have started building uh, with practitioners, activists, and scholars uh, a collective syllabus on pirate care. The first round of topics were written in the November of uh, last year during a, a writing retreat, which we organized in Rijeka. Um, and it was launched uh, on March 8th, just before uh, the pandemic be began across uh, Europe within the exhibition, exhibition of uh, exhibition of bread, wine, cars, security and peace at the Kunsthalle uh, in Vienna. Um, you can see here on the left-hand side of the slide of uh, my screenshot, uh, the topics that we have uh, currently within uh, our uh, syllabus, uh, I guess you're seeing also my head there, um, which includes criminalization of solidarity, uh, sea rescue and care, which was written collectively with the members of the Sea Watch, uh, debt and housing struggles, which was co-written by uh, Anna Vilenica and uh, Eva Marcetic from Right to the City Zagreb, uh, psychosocial autonomy, which was uh, written by Power Makes Us Sick, community safety from racialized policing, uh, trans feminist hacking, hormone toxicity, um, politicizing digital piracy, and so on and uh, so forth. Uh, I encourage you to go to syllabus.pirate.care, as you can see up there. It's a relatively easy to remember URL and just uh, peruse, explore. Uh, those topics. Um, some of them are uh, more a stub and sort of an initial phase of writing. Some of them are relatively complete, and uh, I'm sure you, you'll, you'll discover a lot there. So uh, just go to the URL. Um, next slide. A syllable sit down framework, which is called Sendpoints. Uh, and is developed by Marcel primarily, is built from uh, plain text documents that are written in uh, markdown syntax, which is a simple human readable uh, markup language. Markdown documents are kept on a Git version control system uh, that allows collaborative writing and easy forking to create new versions out of the existing syllabi. From there, they are rendered into a static HTML website, which doesn't require a resource intensive and easily breakable database system, such as, for instance, WordPress, uh, or that one that works in the background of a, a WordPress CMS system. A syllabus uh, is integrated with a collection of books. Uh, Ranef, can you bring up the, the uh, next slide, please? Okay, so what you see in the background, it's the interface of another piece of software we've been developing uh, and a website called Memory of the World, uh, which is a shadow library, which is our sort of pirate care activity as uh, librarians uh, creating an infrastructure for sharing books. Uh, so each, uh, each syllabus has uh, a collection to accompany it 
you can click on it through, from the syllabus. So a syllabus is integrated with a collection of books, articles, and documents cataloged and maintained in this memory of the world uh, interface. Both syllabus and collection can be easily transferred to a U USB thumb drive uh, or another server or printed out uh, on into a PDF file so you can um, share it as one document. The syllabus and the catalog can be built to suit the needs of different processes of collecting learning. So initially, the way we envision it, we work with, say, uh, right to the city activists or housing activists in London, and then we work with the housing activists in Berlin to extend what we've done already with um, uh, the initiative in, in London, uh, write some more, edit the existing uh, elements of uh, uh, the syllabus, and then uh, organize a collective learning process from that, maybe in a third place. Um, so this makes it easy for a housing struggles initiative in Berlin to fork a syllabus, which we have initially developed and adapted to their own context and needs. Such a syllabus can then equally be hosted on an internet server or used uh, offline in an off-the-grid learning situation, while still preserving the internal links between the documents and the links to the text in the accompanying searchable resource collection. To say a little bit about how we see the politics of uh, doing uh, learning, radical, radical collective learning uh, by developing a specific set of technological tools. We see the technopolitics of uh, our endeavor, uh, first of all, as distinct from two dominant perspectives uh, of the politics of digital networks. Um, the first perspective starts from the assumption that through the control of communication infrastructure and surveillance, we are all now caught in the dragnet of algorithmic governance, which is controlled by commercial operators and surveillance states. In that condition, our only recourse is to the tech-savvy hackers brave enough to blow the lid on a world controlled by the military-industrial complex and commodified communication networks. Uh, so those would be the Assanges, the Snowdens, and Mennings. <clears throat> and this is all Right, no, this is evidently a problem, and these are, are people doing it, the heroes. But against this hegemonic perspective, we rather understand digital technologies as a means that uh, transform economic relations and the societal distribution of resources. Uh, so uh, a politics of resources, which starts from piracy, is unlike hacking, the practice of disobedience for the masses. It's done by many uh, across the world. And it's a great, great equalizer in a di digital world marked by growing economic unevenness. So it's very much a politics of resources rather than politics of control or counter control. Um, the second dominant perspective that we sort of uh, position ourselves against or uh, sort of are working around uh, starts with the assumption that we also partially describe, uh, subscribe to is that information wants to be free. But regardless of the fact that access is facilitated uh, by a privately run digital platform, regardless of the fact, so typically the position is that information wants to be free, regardless of the fact that access is facilitated by privately run digital platforms. Yet, in our view, simply having access to information, culture, and knowledge is not enough. The question is, on whose terms is that access? It can't be on terms of digital capitalist platforms, as that risks shredding the web of societal interdependence that defines care and rendering it disposable. We need to see digital resources occasions for building mutualism, collective learning, and radical pedagogies on the terms of those who are invisible, vulnerable, vulnerable, and discriminated against. And uh, on this note, I would like to hand it over to Valeria as she will reflect a bit more on 
the current pandemic conjuncture where this has left us. Um, and um, she'll reflect also more on how technologies have intervened in, in, in uh, that moment. Valeria. We can't hear you, Valeria. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, I, yeah. um, I was just saying, uh, to follow on from what Tommy was suggesting regarding technologies, uh, which is kind of ironic because I didn't turn my mic on. But anyway, um, we have been now uh, kind of hard at work trying to think what are the entry points uh, where some politics can take body uh, in this um, kind of interfacing of care practices and technology. And um, Tommy already outlined a couple of, of these moments where we, we need to kind of stop and, and consider so that we don't have either the savior hackers coming to rescue us from our computers, nor we limit the analysis to problems of free speech, which uh, often lead to nowhere, really. Um, and so for us to insist on the pedagogy that can happen uh, precisely when we start to consider the intimate and intricate relation care practices and technological tools can be a, a useful starting point to detect some of, of the problems. So, for instance, of someone called Anne Marie, who was suggesting, who she's an anthropologist and she looks a lot at what happens in in care homes and and other such facilities, and she basically offers a definition of uh, care and technology that is pretty much in a continuum. Is they're not polar opposites, and we many of us have been kind of trying to think that. Uh, what has to do with care is something that is warm, it has to do with human touch, it has to do with uh, personal contact versus technologies being cold or being systemic versus care being something that belongs to the private. So there's a lot of dichotomies that kind of shape the way many of us think of these two subjects, right? But uh, what a different perspective can bring is that if one starts to look at how care takes place in the everyday, it becomes more and more apparent how many collective practices of care that we uh, are all immersed with and participate in have their components in technology and they have their components in a kind of human-led uh, agency. And, and these two uh, really basically set up a nice ground for political interventions at the moment. Um, in the last few months, uh, we have really been uh, asked a lot to intervene and, and reflect together with others around the present conjuncture, right? So what Gramsci would call uh, a conjuncture is basically trying to figure out what's going on in the world, what's happening, where is the energy flowing, where are the politics happening? Uh, and for, so where we are at, and really I'm, I'm, I'm saying this from uh, just a kind of free speech moment in, in flux, but I hope it might resonate with some of, of those who are listening in and the others on this panel is that basically we are witnessing with this pandemic um, a really an entrenchment of uh, situations that were brewing underneath and that previously many of us would think uh, we would be coached to think as normality, which is anyway a weird concept, but they're not normal in any way. But on the one hand, um, Few commentators are saying as well. So on the one hand, we are witnessing uh, um, a kind of a widespread moment of awareness of all of the invisibilized care labor that takes place all the time with the pandemic, right? So we had many of the applauses to uh, care workers, to nurses, frontline staff. We had a lot of uh, symbolic gestures where these people were named on the media as heroes. Uh, we had the similar reaction 
also, for instance, with firefighters fighting the the recent uh, kind of wave of global fires connected to climate change and so forth and so on. So this glorification um, made highly visible uh, a class of workers that we can call care workers who are often uh, conveniently left out of the picture in many ways or their stories are narrated in ways that really would merit some kind of uh, intervention and, and reclaiming of, of how that happens. On the one hand, so there was this of making hyper visible and glorifying the uh, everyday mundane work of maintaining, repairing, sustaining uh, the world. Uh, but that was kind of short lived phenomenon insofar as the, none of that kind of led to a rethinking of what are the tools, the technologies, their resources, their knowledges, their infrastructures that this kind of work would need in order to be able to be carried out well and in, in such a way uh, where the care workers themselves are not asked to become sacrificial and they're not asked to be heroes and the hero is a figure that obviously in the end is uh, a praise because she or he dies, right? So, um, so there is, there's some of that that happened and especially during the second wave of pandemics, uh, this kind of figure of the care worker, it's something that we'd like to reflect upon and how it's again becoming renormalized very quickly. On the other hand, we have had commentators that describe a new relationship in between the invocation of care, right, left, and center. There's so, so many initiatives, so many politicking this world of care right now. But this this care horizon is being appropriated in such a way, where again uh, there is a, uh, it, it it kind of fails to uh, match a precise description of what would be a materialist analysis of what needs to change, what needs to be. Uh, reprovisioned, re reconfigured uh, in terms of welfare of the of the broader general interest, right? Um, Naomi Klein and among others uh, summarized the situation of what what is happening instead with the uh, with this catchphrase that she uses, the Screen New Deal, which is a kind of play of word uh, upon the more famous. Uh, titled the Green New Deal. And this Green New Deal she describes as an unprecedented an allegiance between the and uh, the political classes, where basically instead of having uh, a scenario uh, triggered by the pandemic where there could be some sort of uh, reinvestment uh, and, and a new support for publicly run infrastructures of care. What we're seeing instead is uh, many pundits and many lobbyists from the tech uh, platforms pushing for deals where effectively welfare provisions are being delegated to online platforms, which are privately owned. And uh, this is creating uh, a situation whereby uh, you have part of the population that basically is becoming uh, caught in a, a what, what has been named a shut-in economy. So uh, those of us who are privileged enough to have indeed a home and a shelter over our heads um, are seeing the, the spaces of work and the space time of work and life uh, being unprecedentedly eroded uh, with new responsibilities and old responsibilities mingling such as, such as childcare in the face of uh, complete uh, defunding of schooling in this moment. And again, many countries are uh, investing massively in uh, digital pedagogy, uh, quickly done, badly conceived, but anyway, rather than um, putting resources to restaffing uh, school infrastructures. And so we have this part of the population that is caught in a shut-in economy 
being pitched effectively against the second half of the population of the working classes who are again those invisibilized workers that are running the human component of uh, the services that apparently should be running smoothly through these digital platforms right so anything from delivery of food uh, to uh, maintenance and repair and 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 so forth so yeah i guess uh this is where we are at and in all of this uh to introduce the reflection that we hope to to share with the others on the on this panel today um it is often important to mention that such invisibilized and exposed workers um, are mostly uh migrant populations and often women and people of color and that live already in situations that are highly pressurized in terms of being the targets of draconian bureaucratic systems that do everything in their powers to make uh, their lives a constant border to be crossed and uh, in terms of our own practice, uh, I just want to maybe end with this. One of the most important uh, examples we found early on in our research around pyrocare was set up by um, in the US by the by slaves kind of running away from the the plantation economy, the 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 so-called uh, underground railway. And, uh, and in that sense, the underground railways recently become a new metaphor to describe how migrant networks are self-organizing within Europe right now to take care of each other, not just at the border, at the first border and country in Europe, but actually setting up more and more systems of solidarity and mutual aid and mutual care that disseminate across what they call like second degree kind of migration because the border never stops. So on this note, I think I'm gonna uh, invite Kathleen perhaps to uh, bring us to the juice of today's speech and, uh, and maybe follow up on some of these reflections and tell us more about Setsuneri, with whom we hope still that we will be able to uh, co-write a syllabus at some point later this year. Thanks. Thank you and hello everyone and thank you very much uh, Tommy and Valeria and for the invitation and collective practices for hosting us. Um, I will introduce as an area and in a way I would kind of like to take the discussions that uh, the two of you started very much to the ground like also literally to the to the fields. So Cezaneri is a social policy campaign for the rights of agricultural workers, seasonal workers, therefore the Cezaneri name um, in Austria. And it's a bit specific, so I will try to talk uh, first about the structure, uh, because it's not, I mean, it is an activist-led campaign, but it's not uh, a self-organized campaign. So what we here have to consider is that there are several parties involved, bringing very different knowledge and infrastructure to the campaign. On one hand, uh, there are the activists who are also responsible for bridging, uh, so to say, this uh, distance between the trade union and the workers on the fields, because as you can imagine, one of the first challenges of the campaign is how to um, get in touch with workers on the fields who I actually would a bit counter this discussion on visibility because you mentioned that a lot of these key or uh, essential workers are invisibilized, which is on one hand true, but at the same time, this is what uh, my, uh, my activist uh, comrade Sonia Mello was saying in another interview that they are, of course, also extremely visible workers on the fields uh, we have encountered, I think, uh, I mean, all our lives in the different countries in which we've been moving on the road. And then the question is, of course, what it is that we want to see behind uh, the very little that we know about this work that's going on the fields in the different contexts. So in that sense, Sezoneri is bringing together activists, um, 
the trade union in Austria, which is called, uh, I mean, there are several trade unions. The ones that Cezanneri is uh, aligned with is the Produktionsgewerkschaft, responsible also for agricultural work. And then there are also very important partner organizations who were crucial also to the funding of Cezanneri, such as UNDOC, which is a, a kind of trade union-like platform coming actually also from self-organized activist initiatives on undocumented work, then Menvia and Lefeu, both of them are supporting migrants. Uh, Lefeu is uh, supporting uh, especially female migrants uh, and Menvia male migrants uh, who are often impacted by human trafficking. And maybe this is important to consider. A lot of people don't consider this when thinking of seasonal agriculture work, but that uh, in this context, the exploitation can take dimensions which raise questions around human trafficking. This is, I think, something that should also be kept in mind. So like what degrees of exploitation are we actually talking about? And then there are, of course, uh, partner organizations which are more concerned on one hand with migrant work, such as Migrare and Nieleni, which is concerned with food sovereignty. So I just wanted to list them because I think it's interesting to see these intersections of, uh, of different activities. And of course, all these organizations are supposed to function in the campaign in a kind of complementary way. So it's bringing together different skills, knowledges, infrastructure. And the trade union is in a significant part responsible for financing the campaign. So I think this is also something important to stress because often we ask ourselves like how are activists led campaigns financed and in the case of Cezanneri it's actually very important to have funding and now I would like to ask for the first slide uh, uh, Ranef please. So Cezanneri started in 2013 here you see uh, or actually Cezanneri itself started in 2014 and the image you see here is 2013 from a farm in Tyrol where workers decided to protest. And maybe here, just as a side note, I would like to also note that often we associate labor struggles with uh, struggles for better working conditions, which is of course true, but very true in the case of seasonal work is also the fact that workers feel most confident to protest when they have nothing to lose. So when they already know that they are actually going to stop, uh, for example, doing seasonal agricultural work. And this was also the case for many of the workers you see in this image. So I think this is, again, something important to consider also in terms of what it means to do seasonal work. Uh, so next image, please. I just wanted to share a bit like how Cezanneri functions as an information campaign. We have a website uh, from which you see the main page here. And uh, of course, here you find a lot of information about the workers' rights. And maybe just also to say why is it important to find information about the workers' uh, rights. We can also go to the next slide, please. Um, these are the information folders we have, which include also like uh, work calendars. So what you don't really see here, but uh, I mean, what you can see is that uh, we have information in several languages. So you, I mean, which is uh, quite obvious that migrant seasonal work concerns a lot of people, uh, especially from Eastern Europe, from within the EU, but also from third countries. In the case of Austria, it's mostly regionally organized. So. I think the majority of the agriculture workers uh, are coming from Romania, then quite a lot of workers are also coming from Bulgaria. And then depending on the geography of where the workers are within Austria, there are people coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Slovakia, uh, Hungary as well. And uh, I mean, especially around the borders, this is very much defined by which countries are are the closest. So one thing is that uh, Cezanneri provides uh, information in several languages. And the other thing is that uh, it's important to know that in uh, Austria, the rights of seasonal workers are quite well regulated, which is kind of a contradiction, I would say. There are collective contracts. So this means that actually workers have a very specific legal, um, I mean, legal um, basis to appeal for their rights. 
However, these collective contracts are different in each of the nine federal states. So as you can imagine, if you come as a seasonal worker to Austria and you might be working in different states, uh, federal states, uh, then you have to be informed about uh, the working conditions in each of those states. So this makes, of course, uh, the whole question of uh, accessing information a big challenge for the workers who are, of course, most of the time, not only working in Austria, but several other uh, different uh, countries, uh, mainly uh, across Europe. So this, I think, is, uh, is an important challenge to consider also in terms of uh, organizing. And uh, next slide, please. Yes, so I, re I also wanted to talk about the fact that the uh, Saisonary on one hand uh, is, of course, addressing the harvest workers themselves, but it's also very important. And I would say that it's uh, also, I mean, ironically, the, uh, the field in which Saisonary is very successful is uh, in uh, intervening uh, in public discourse, so in addressing majority society in Austria. And this is done in very different ways. So on one of these images, you can see uh, activists from the Saisonary campaign uh, shooting information videos, part of which is information for the workers, but part of which is actually information for majority society to be informed about uh, working conditions in the area of agriculture. And on the other uh, part of the image, you see a poster, which is a poster for a um, kind of a lecture performance which used the, the research of uh, Saisonary activists and their protocols from field action in order to build a kind of theatre performance that uh, of course is again like bringing these discourses into, I mean in this case specifically the art field but also very much uh, public discourse. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so this uh, is something that I would like to talk about more specifically here. You see uh, one of uh, our activist comrades uh, on the field uh, talking with workers. So one of the important parts of uh, the campaign and, and mostly also the activist work, uh, activists' work is uh, going to the fields, uh, which happens, uh, I mean, in different ways, by bicycle, by car, uh, less by public transport, because of course they are not so accessible, um, and talking to the workers, sharing with them the information folders we have, the work calendars. Work calendars are especially important as a very uh, simple analog tool in which workers can document their working hours, because this is usually one of the basis uh, of uh, the labor struggles that they can lead later on. And uh, of course, I mean, as you can imagine, I already mentioned that workers uh, are, of course, from different countries speaking different languages. So one of, I mean, important concerns also for the activists within Saisonary is to speak these languages ourselves uh, or to, uh, I mean, or to recruit activists who speak uh, different languages and to try to build a relationship. I mean, there are several things to consider by field actions in terms of uh, political uh, questions also around care, because of course uh, we have to take uh, take care not to uh, put the, the workers into a difficult situation with their employers. We usually have to ask for the permission of the farmer or the coordinator of um, the work uh, workers who is present in order to enter the fields, etc. So there are uh, Tommy and Valeria was asking us also about the legal uh, implications of such activist work, and here of course the protection of private property is very often something that the farmers are using to restrict uh, our access uh, to to make contact. And um, we can go to the next slide, please. So here you see some other images of, um, of the field actions. And these field actions are, of course, also based on research. So we have to uh, structure them and organize them seasonally, depending on what is being produced and where are the workers actually working. Some of the workers work in the fields, but uh, some of them are also working in the um in the storage areas so doing the packaging etc and uh, something that's also important to mention we can go to the next slide please 
is that, of course, uh, solidarity is a very important uh, issue in this sense, like not only us activists being in solidarity with the workers, which also, um, I mean, necessitates a kind of uh, anti-racist approach, which is something that we are also trying to raise, um, I mean, the trade unions awareness of uh, how to yeah, how to engage with and how to also care for migrant workers and support them in their struggles. But solidarity is also a very big issue in um, labor struggles on the ground, because uh, very often when some of the workers decide to speak up, they might uh, often uh, be isolated. So it's also not always clear, is this struggle an individual one or can it become collective? And there is often... Uh, issues around uh, workers desolidarizing mainly because they are uh, afraid to lose their jobs by joining the person who is uh, protesting or the, the, the several, I mean, if there might be several people as well. And of course, there is this discourse, which I think often comes up when we talk about uh, the politics uh, of uh, migration, the discourse uh, of majority society stressing gratefulness and thankfulness and that you have to be happy to be able to work uh, in the conditions uh, that are proposed to you in, in this case in, in Austria. Uh, I also wanted to talk very shortly, uh, but please let me know and interrupt me if I ran out of time. I think I might have a few minutes more, but I'm not sure. Can you let me know? Yeah, oh, good. please do use another. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so just very quickly, I mean, uh, I, here I wanted to share a few um, newspaper articles, of course, during the pandemic, especially in the beginning, discussions uh, were really, um, I mean, I mean, discussions uh, around uh, agricultural work and seasonal work were at the forefront because of the fears that the workers uh, will, cannot travel and that they will be immobilized. And uh, of course, there were also calls, maybe if it's interesting, we can discuss this later, for local populations to join the work on the fields and to be, I don't know, good patriots uh, and become heroes themselves and go and uh, do the hard physical labor of agriculture work. This, I mean, although there were supposedly in each of the countries that did such campaigns, of course, a lot of volunteers uh, appeared, but, uh, I think that uh, it very quickly became uh, clear that this is not a sustainable solution. And uh, it's also, again, raised these questions that it's actually degrading uh, the work that is uh, being done um, by calling on uh, volunteers to do it, uh, which was quite problematic. And uh, even the farmers themselves were not supporting uh, this uh, i would like to very shortly go back to the slides once again if i can because i wanted to show um, just to be clear like what are the conditions that face workers uh, example given in austria uh, we can go um, on to the next slide so on one hand of course there were huge discussions about what travel conditions were provided during the pandemic here you see uh, workers waiting for planes to fly to Germany. We can proceed to the next slide. And this is again, uh, like very much raising questions around the, the safety and health of uh, workers on the move. And then we can also proceed to the next slide. There will be a few, uh, and again, uh, we can go on. I'm sorry, I just want, so yes, yeah, so I wanted to just show you to be clear, like, what are we talking about? So during the pandemic, uh, this is the accommodation that was provided by uh, farmers, uh, a larger uh, uh, farmer uh, farm for uh, workers uh, in, uh, I mean, very near Vienna. And as you can see, you have, at least there were more beds in this room. So you had uh, around six to eight people sleeping in, uh, in such conditions during a pandemic. We can go on and I can show you the rest of the images. So, of course, uh, these images sometimes make it into the media as they did in the case of uh, this case where we were there personally, a saisonary campaign to document uh, the conditions. 
But uh, I think the problem is also that it's a bit of uh, shining the light uh, on a situation and then of course the light very quickly, so our attention span for such uh, struggles is, uh, is very short, at least in, in what's uh, concerned in, um, in media discourse. Um, so I just uh, wanted to, to show these images also to counter a bit. Uh, often uh, there was a lot of uh, hope around what uh, the visibility or this increased visibility of essential work uh, can uh, impact or result in uh, for the migrant workers themselves. And unfortunately, the pandemic showed very much the contrary, that uh, working conditions uh, very often even deteriorated also because uh, of the fact that uh, many workers were very much relying on on the possibility to work uh, for for existential reasons and of course for the situation in uh, their countries of origin uh, i mean which of course we also have to address these aspects of uh, transnational uh, inequality i would uh, I would actually stop here because I hope that uh, I could give you a bit of insight into how uh, Sazonary works and then of course we can continue later on with the discussion. Thank you, Katalin. Um, so maybe I would now hang, hand it uh, over to Flavia and Dora to present the work of Dret and then we'll come back uh, with uh, questions. I hope uh, there will be questions from uh, the audience as well. Um, we'll just do the presentation first and then um, let the questions be, be asked. Uh, I think Inga will uh, channel the questions. Uh, I don't know if there, if there is a direct channel, but uh, we'll manage that. Um, so, uh, Flavia, Dora, please. Thank you also from our uh, side for the invitation. And yeah, we're very happy to be here and to share a bit of our story and our experiences. Um, before I start, I just want to make uh, clear that I'm not a care worker, I'm an activist uh, uh, supporting this mobilization of migrant care workers. And my colleague Dora is, however, a care worker. Um, and I want to make sure she is right now at um, um, at, at work, uh, and I want to make sure that she feels comfortable if, if Dora, if you need to go back to uh, your patient or uh, that you feel comfortable to do it, and I will just take over, yeah, if you need to leave. Because the migrant living care workers in Austria are working around the clock, uh, so the breaks are very, very small, and um, there's always uh, unexpected things happening, so. This is one of the challenges that we face in our uh, organizing and uh, work. So uh, yeah, let's go right to the slides. If that's all right with the technical team. Great, so um, Dora and I are part of the DREPT organization, as Tommy already mentioned. Um, we basically uh, deal with the Romanian uh, care workers community, but I want to stress uh, that we are working uh, on a, a bigger movement uh, that has the purpose of bringing together all um, migrant care uh, workers together in a bigger, stronger, uh, more visible movement, um, regardless the um, their ethnicity or country of origin. Uh, so. This project has already been initiated at the end of last year. Um, this bigger platform is called uh, IG24, so Interest Group um, for 24-7 uh, Live-In Care Workers. Um, and this is a platform initiated by our organization, DREPT, and the organization Iniciativa uh, 24, which is a similar organization that works with uh, Slovak living care workers. So these are the bigger groups of migrant care workers uh, active in Austria. Um, and also probably because these are the bigger communities, uh, also the most active in the sense of uh, solidarity, uh, mobilizing, um, organizing, and so on. So I would go then to the next slide. Um, 
just a couple of infos about um, us. Um, the, uh, an essential difference uh, between us and the Sezonieri Campagna is that um, we are self-organized, so the um, DREPT project uh, um, initiated within the community. This idea already existed before I even got in contact with my colleagues uh, in DREPT. So um, it was an idea that was boiling um, or bubbling up in the Romanian community for the last at least four years. Um, and yeah, um, there has there has been on and off activism and on and off solidarity actions um, and um, um, little initiatives, let's call them like that, also over the last years and all of these kind of build up to this, um, to, to DREPT basically. So DREPT uh, first um, uh, started out at the beginning of last year, first informally, um, we basically just decided on the name and um, starting a Facebook group and the initial idea was just to uh, use this um, uh, Facebook page, I'm sorry, not group Facebook page, uh, to inform Romanian care workers about their rights. Uh, just give um, basic information about labor rights, uh, try to assist them, uh, answer their questions, uh, uh, just be basically a point of information for them. Uh, quickly after that, the COVID-19 crisis uh, started. Uh, so I think one and a half months or two months right after we, we started the DREPT project and this changed completely our perspective. Um, so from a little Facebook page informing um, migrant care workers, we very, very quickly and under very much pressure uh, had to mobilize all our resources in um, assisting uh, care workers that were facing crisis situations, uh, doing conflict management um, between care workers and placement agencies or care workers and uh, um, collaborators of their patients or the relatives of their patients. Um, we did um, informing uh, because as you can imagine, um, most of the, almost all of the care workers in Austria are migrant care workers. Romanians are the biggest group, um, and because they um, there's this mobility between uh, countries, um, the laws are also incredibly complicated, and you have to observe in parallel two different uh, uh, countries and two different sets of regulations. So this is also something that we try to do, uh, keep informed what the um, situation at the borders uh, is uh, what are the conditions to enter Austria, leave Austria, enter Romania, leave Romania, um, and so on. But also, what happened in the community is um, um, was quite inspiring. Uh, there were some um, little initiatives, like for instance, Dora's project that. Um, I think before had little contact with activism and during the pandemic started this Facebook group that has as, had as a purpose, as a main purpose, to facilitate access for care workers to state financial aid in Austria. Um, uh, because as you can imagine, uh, most <laughs> structural processes in Austria are just in the German language. Um, even if the statistics are very well known, especially in this work sector, we know that uh, almost all the care workers uh, are migrant care workers. We know exactly from which countries they come, uh, what are the numbers and so on. Still, um, everything is available only in German. So it was very difficult during the pandemic for the migrant care workers to access this financial aid and um, yeah, basically not be threatened by, by um, financial threats for them and their families. Um, and this is something that Dora's group did amazingly well. They made tutorials, they gathered all the information, they mobilized uh, other care workers that spoke a little bit of German or had experience with these applications to help other care workers. So there was a lot of solidarity happening within this year. And this sort of solidarity was also the engine um, for, um, for our organization. I would like to go back to the slides, please. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so what we want to do with DREPT is basically uh, provide a fair representation of all um, migrant uh, live-in care workers. Our focus is the um, Romanian community, but uh, through the IG24, we want to um, um, yeah, offer a fair representation to all the, the migrant workers. Uh, I would go to the next slide. So this is the Facebook page with which we started. Uh, meanwhile, we have almost 10,000, almost 11,000 followers. Our community group is also growing uh, with every week. So there's quite an active community. Uh, I would say it's growing with every um, every week, and um, uh, we all work voluntarily. So our resources are always a bit under um, under pressure or challenged. Uh, we can go to the next slide. But we don't work only online. We also work offline. Um, we also attended a lot of protests this year. Um, but I would like it. I would like you to have an exact um, image of this uh, work sector. For us, it's not, um, or for the migrant care workers, it's not easy to organize politically because, as I mentioned. The migrant care workers are working 24-7. So um, as they are at work, they're not, the, most of them um, have very little breaks, so one or two hours per day at lunchtime, uh, but very many don't even have that. So they cannot leave the um, household. They're always in the household of their patients. So they cannot, it's, it's a luxury for many of them to be able to go out um, and protest, something that for us is uh, quite, um, um, self-implied and uh, but actually a privilege um, but we managed more and more um, also the patients and the, the families of the patients started are starting to understand the importance of the visibility issue that you also mentioned so that live-in care workers do not profit from the visibility of the uh, seasonal workers because they are always scattered all over um, Austria in solitude uh, in um, individual households we can go also to the next slide. And yeah, great. Um, so I would just let you have like an, an overview over uh, this work sector in Austria. So we're talking about almost 60,000 um, migrant care workers, um, out of which around 900 are Austrian. So as I said, the, almost all of them are migrant care workers. The biggest groups come from Romania, Slovakia, and Croatia, but we're also talking about Hungary, we're talking um, about uh, Bulgaria, we're talking about Slovenia, Poland, uh, so basically most uh, Eastern Central European countries. It's mostly a feminized work, so most of the living care workers are women. A lot of them, or um, a big core of this uh, community, are women that are over 45 years old, but there is a new generation uh, uh, um, a younger generation, so generation, Dora's generation maybe, that is um, uh, growing with each year. Um, for the Romanian living care workers, can we go back? Very, sorry, uh, I just want to explain to you how the work actually is carried out. So the Romanian care workers uh, have uh, are working in shifts that are normally four weeks. There's also two or three shifts, but normally in average, uh, uh, most of them are four weeks shifts. And then they go back to Romania to their families and have a four week breaks. Uh, they earn between, on average, between 40 and 80 um, euros per day. Uh, so that is around two to three euros per hour. Uh, there's also some uh, um, jobs that uh, um, are higher, that offer high, higher wages than 80 euros per day. So we're talking about 100 or 120 euros per day. But these are actually quite uh, um, luxurious offers and rare. Um, yeah, so the, the working hours are very long, as I said, 24 seven and sometimes with no break. We can go to the next slide now. Yeah, and about the structural framework of this community. So the migrant care workers are actually self-employed. So they don't benefit from normal um, um, employment contracts. That means that theoretically they are they profit from autonomy and theoretically they profit from flexibility. But actually, in reality, this is a false um, self-employment. So 
uh, they are bound to one client. They cannot work for more clients uh, during four weeks. They are bound to one household, one client. Um, they are not able to negotiate their wages or their working conditions. This is done mostly by placement agencies and the patients or the patient's families. And the care workers basically get the um, already negotiated offer that they can say yes or no to. Uh, but uh, actively negotiating their working conditions is uh, not a reality. Uh, they uh, also have a very strong dependency to the placement agencies. Um, and out of this dependency, a lot of abuse and exploitation um, occurs. Um, the structural framework that uh, um, facilitates this abuse are the working contracts, so the, the placement contracts. Uh, that include a lot of abusive conditions that disadvantage the carers. So we're talking about, um, uh, how do you say Vollmacht in English? Um, this, um, so there's a document where, in the contract, there's a clause where... The, Authorization. Um, yes, exactly. Thank you. Um, so through this clause, the care workers basically hand over the rights over their self-employment to the uh, placement agencies. The placement agencies is responsible for uh, paying their taxes, paying their social uh, insurance, um, and managing their uh, wages. So again, the uh, the care workers basically lose their um, uh, autonomy uh, through these working contracts, and a lot of problems uh, come out of this. So we had many situations where uh, the um, social insurances were not um, uh, paid, although this was the responsibility of the placement agencies and the care workers got fines from the um, social, um, social security um, or their um, self-employment was uh, um, uh, shut down um, or uh, registered uh, as on pause. So a lot of abuses like this happened and the care workers have um, very little to no possibility to uh, fight against. Um, can we go back to the slides? Thanks. Um, as I said, because they are not regularly employed, they don't have labor protection. So they don't benefit from unemployment support. They don't have the right to seek a leave. Um, they cannot, uh, they don't profit from collectively negotiated uh, uh, wages. They don't have the uh, luxury of um, uh, unionizing or protections through chamber of labors and so on. And one of the central issues in this self-employment is that because they're self-employed, they're represented officially by the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce represents all companies and firms, so therefore also the placement agencies. So when there is a conflict between these two sides, care worker and placement agencies, which is the normal example of conflict in this work sector, um, the care workers don't have any any structural support because for the Chamber of, uh, of Commerce, there's a conflict of interest. Both sides are their members, so they can't intervene. Uh, we always get the, the standard answer in these situations that the care workers should uh, uh, contract a private lawyer to uh, solve uh, their, their problems, which of course is for a private person and a migrant in a foreign country extremely diff difficult. We can go to the next slide. Yes, and during, I would just uh, very shortly mention what we did during uh, the last year um, and why it was so necessary to mobilize so strongly. Um, suddenly, a work sector that was very much invisible um, in, in the Austrian context, in the Austrian media, um, from one day to the other became very visible. Um, once the first lockdown occurred and the borders were um, closed, there was a big threat of a uh, um, collapse in the care system. And suddenly there was very much media attention, um, some of it positive or um, uh, theoretically positive, um, but a lot, there, there was a lot of talk um, about these migrant care workers as merchandise. So we were talking a lot, we were seeing uh, a lot in the medias that care workers are shipped in, shipped out, transported by plane, by 
uh, by train, uh, uh, given this, uh, they have to be tested, they have to wear masks. So there was a lot of, uh, of talk as if they were not human beings exposed to the same risks of uh, COVID contamination, like all the rest of us, uh, they, were, um, they were treated as merchandise, more or less. Uh, especially in the big, uh, in the um, first phase, there was a lot of unrest and a lot of um, um, anger in the community because there was a lot of talk um, of care workers that might put their patients uh, at risk. They might bring in the virus to Austria. They might um, contaminate their patients and so on. But at the beginning of the pandemic, the numbers in Austria were actually much higher than the numbers in Romania. So actually. Uh, if you would have looked just at the numbers, the risk for um, the care workers to get sick in Austria was much higher than them contaminating their patients. And nevertheless, uh, the talk in the public discourse was always that the care workers have to wear masks, they have to get tested, they have to um, uh, respect these very strict regulations, but there was no talk about their patients getting tested or the relatives of their patients that uh, were visiting regularly uh, the households uh, um, were not so, so they were not forced to get any tests. So there was no measures for the migrant care workers to stay safe and be protected from contamination. Uh, so this was a reason for a lot of anger and unrest within the communities. And this was also a political strategy that continued throughout the whole year. So all the restrictions and all these um, um, uh, regulations were addressing the migrant workers, but there were no um, um, measures to actually protect the migrant workers from getting uh, um, also contaminated. Um, I'm just wondering if I still have time or am I at the end of my time window? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, a couple of minutes more maybe. Uh, and if Dora wants to speak, no, I don't know. Uh, we actually discussed like this that I will do the presentation and Dora will answer the questions afterwards. Ah, so okay. I just want then to mention like them. three minutes more if you need to wrap up. And Great. Then <laughs> that's that's perfect. Um, so what we actually want to do and what our plan um, as a movement is, we are we are, we are contesting this uh, false self-employment at the political level. We're trying to um, make this um, um, as known as possible in the uh, Austrian society. And we're trying to push on political lobby for a reform in this sense that the care workers are moved from the self-employment to the empl employment system so that they are really protected against abuse and um, exploitation. So this would be like our long-term political goal which as you can imagine with our current government is very unlikely to uh, um, happen uh, in the near future so it's a short term uh, goal we are in parallel trying to build up a um, um, counseling um, infrastructure where migrant care workers can call can write can address uh, questions or they, they can come to with their problems or their crisis situation and they can get help and assistance in their own language. Um, so this is our uh, project for 2021. And yeah, as you can imagine, uh, with a, a lot of volunteering and um, uh, little to no uh, structural help from authorities or institutions, uh, it's quite challenging, but we do, we are a big movement and we, we have the numbers behind us. So there's uh, pros and cons to our way of organizing. Um, Dora, if I uh, forgot to mention something, I would invite you to make uh, uh, or uh, to add anything you feel like. Everything is OK, Flavia. You um, presented the big picture of our work better than I. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. That means it's, uh, we're done with our side. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe before we move to our big picture questions, uh, to Dora, uh, how do you see the, the detailed uh, picture from where you are? Uh, how do you feel about the current situation and uh, the future uh, in 
immediate couple of years. Obviously, Austria and other societies will have to uh, reconsider their policies of care provision, of care for the elderly and the sick, and uh, that might also impact or be an opportunity strategic for uh, labor organizing in the care sector, but also it might carry certain threats to uh, labor in, in the care sector. So how do you feel about your situation and also how do you see from, from that your situation? What, what is the immediate future? Um, I can say that society is divided in two. A part of society are telling us that Austrian is going to, lead, to need us in long terms because in a few years, we are Austria's um, uh, society is going to need 100,000 uh, home, home care nurses. And on the other side, the um, agencies are t telling us uh, slow down with your protests and slow down because they are going to come uh, a lot of uh, other workers from China, from Thailand, from Indonesia in 10 years and you will not be needed anymore. Uh, and this is the way how society is trying to divide us and to manipulate us and this is not nice. And the government is letting the things the way they are. The government is um, unable to do some right laws for us because uh, we are at the hand of the agencies that's really that's i lived that and my colleagues are living that and um, uh, the gov government has not the, the will or is failing or is unable to um, come up with some better conditions, with some better contracts, with some uh, rules which are assuring us that we are doing a good, a good work. They need us, but they don't offer us the, the right law, the, the right conditions. And my feeling is that it will be a struggle, a long-term struggle. I don't know which is the end. I don't know. All what I, I know right now is that uh, Austrian state and Austrian people and all olders from Austria are needing us. And we are trying to do the best we can. But we have a little bit of support, a little bit of political support, a little bit of better laws. And uh, without organizing ourselves and without uh, mobilizing ourselves, nobody will do nothing for us. And uh, maybe one more uh, thing would immediately interest me is the relation between care workers and those who are cared for. You know, is uh, obviously persons who are cared for are in, in uh, various positions and conditions, so that's really hard to generalize. But uh, is there uh, an avenue to building solidarity? between uh, those who need care and those who give care. So caretakers, would that be caretaker and caregivers? Yes, um, the old people are needing us. I'm telling you my own example. I'm taking care right now uh, of an old lady. Uh, she is um, 97 years old and she's speaking both German and English. And I'm her first take care home nurse, her first betrothal. And we are building our relation. A relation is not may, it's not, you cannot go somewhere and already the relation is built. You have to build the relation. You have to be there for the people who need you and the people who, the, the, the old lady who uh, I'm taking care of, she is aware that she needs me and she is respecting my program and she i am respecting her wishes and we are building this and it's this is our work this is a very complex work from outside uh, someone someone could think that it's it's what what can you do you are having to eat not of them not not of my, not all of my colleagues are having everything they need 
you are having to eat, you are having a warm place, you, um, what do you need more? No, it's not like this. It's like you are getting into a new marriage and you have to know the person and you have to build a relation with the person you are taking care of, with the family. And this is, um, this is our struggle because um, uh, uh, it's up to us and it's up to the family. We have, we have to do our work perfectly and the family has to accept the way they are, the, the way we are. You see, I, I don't know if I was clear enough to explain you. It's very complex. Our work is very complex and it's not just um, just playing games or something like that. Because old mm -hmm. people are having special needs. They are having their rituals. They are eating spe specific uh, dishes. Um, uh, every family is different. Uh, I am building this relation with uh, the old lady I'm taking care of. I'm only for two weeks. This is my third week here. Uh, but we, we, we reach the level that we are laughing every time we have this. And she wants me to be around her. And she knows that I'm giving her a good feeling. And I know she's giving me a good feeling. But for this, you have to work. And both of the parts have to work. Of course, that there are a lot of patients who are addicted to the pills. Uh, patients with dementia, patients which are not so easy to work with, and the family are not always so understanding, and the families don't want to supply medical treatment that the patient needs, and then is a help is a help for, for the, the petroerin, for the home nurse care, it's a help for the patient, it's a help for the family. No, nobody is, is happy there. Of course, there are patients who are not providing, or families who are not providing enough money for uh, our needs, because I, I eat different from, from my old lady. Yes, I do have different needs from her. And the families don't understand that. They, they, they want to use us in order to be there in their conditions. They're not taking um, uh, in, in, um, in, in calculation that we are human beings also. We have needs like the mama or the papa is having needs. This is our mm -hmm. big challenge. And with everything we have to do is our self-employed system. This is another, another big challenge because a lot of my colleagues, they don't know what to do. They are coming in here, they are signing contracts in German. They, they are forced to sign contracts only in German language. And at, at the end of the turnus, they, they are discovering that they are not receiving the money because it was a small clause there in contract written and uh, they, they have to pay for the agency, I don't know what penalties and so on. And they didn't know about it because the contract was only in German. And who should they call? What should they do? Because the uh, Wirtschaftskamera, I, I don't know, Flavia, Wirtschaftskamera is, 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 yes, Chamber of Commerce is, is not taking care of these kind of situations. Uh, we are in conflict with the agencies when when we tried to uh, to go to the uh, chamber of commerce and the agency is there as uh, um, um, it's a conflict of, of interest and a lot a lot of of problems and the law in austria is so so not easy to 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 follow up because we have to register ourselves when the agency is doing that for you, maybe she is not doing right. I, I have a lot of colleagues which are registered where the agency, where the, the, the um, place of agency is, where the, uh, the address of the agency is not correct. I have to be registered where my client is. And a lot of problems are coming from this part because the agency are cashing a lot of money, but they are showing only at their own interests. They are not showing at the interests of the people, of the people who are working with, because we are working with the agencies, not for the agency. This is the complications of, of our work. We have a very much level of stress. First of all, we are 
away from our families, we have to work to not to work, it's unproductive, but to be around our patient 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day, and we are responsible for our patient, not the agency. The agency should take care of our needs. She is not doing, they are not doing, take care of our needs. They are only cashing our money. And if we have a problem, there is no one, there is no one uh, we can call. This is why we have to organize ourselves. This is why we have to mobilize the people to join our organization, because only together we have a chance. I just want Thank to you. go back quickly to your question, Tommy. Uh, if we can establish a partnership with the, with the clients, um, it's, it's something that we really wish to, to do. Um, unfortunately, in many cases, the clients are also on the exploitative side. So we had already a lot of cases where the migrant care workers um, sent us photos with what was available in the fridge for them as food. And you would get these photos with empty fridges, one piece of cheese, uh, uh, one sausage, uh, you would see one bread and uh, that would be it. And the care worker was supposed to eat out of that uh, on a daily basis. Or uh, we would have care workers writing that they're not allowed to um, shower every day. They're allowed to use warm water only two, three times per week because the family wants to save money or uh, electricity or th this kind of stuff. Um, and then it's very difficult to see this group as partners. Uh, not all of us, so th these are not many cases. Uh, most of the, the contacts we have are with placement agencies, but we also have these situations. And then, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, I, I assume there is a lot of tensions also with other possible allies, you know, also uh, social care institutions who also have the mandate to take care of uh, caretakers and uh, they can be on the both sides, uh, I assume. Uh, the, the issue, the, the main issue is that there are no institution uh, that protects the care workers. So for instance, the social, uh, um, the, how do you say, Krankenkassa, the social insurance? Insurance, yeah. Uh, yeah um, basically you can uh, appeal to the social insurance for a quality control if you feel that the care worker is not um, taking care of the patient accordingly. Uh, so on the patient's beside, uh, side, you can um, uh, request a control, a quality control from the social insurance. On the other side, if the um, conditions, the basic living conditions or working conditions, um, they're overlapping, of course, in this sector, for the care worker are not provided, there's no institution that you can Call. There's nothing. I want to make sure that there are, if there are any questions from the audience, that uh, mm -hmm. we should address. There, there is more of a general question or one that seems to address, um, especially pirate care, and that is. How can um, networks of solidarity be conveyed through screens, through the internet, and how do you disseminate your information? Okay, let's maybe return to that one toward the end as we wrap up uh, and stay with Dret and Sezonieri. Maybe uh, an immediate question that falls to mind is the relation to gig workers, you know, who find themselves in a similar condition of uh, self-employment. Um, maybe question to you, Flavia, and, and to you, Kathleen. Are there any alliances uh, uh, within trade unions on those grounds? Uh, obviously, uh, precarious condition of work uh, affects the one. I, I don't know the exact conditions of gig work in, in, in uh, Austria, but I assume uh, that they are similar to elsewhere in Europe. So are, are there uh, sort of connections that build on that and trying to uh, create a larger system of uh, social security for 
workers who work in these precarious conditions as nominally self-employed but obviously highly exploited uh, labor force. I was just told the other day that there's somebody who was uh, uh, arrogantly saying like, ah, uh, Croatian economy is still socialist. In Austria, there is 50% of self-employed as if it was necessarily a commendable fact. Now everybody's an entrepreneur, but that's just a lie be behind that fact, no. Um, I mean, maybe I just share my, um, I mean, I'm self-employed myself, so I can totally relate to also the issues of uh, administration and I mean, all the, all the self-administration you have to do as self-employed. And I mean, I've been living for seven years in uh, Austria and I speak the language and nevertheless, uh, it's a very challenging uh, issue. Also. Equally challenging is actually the contact with the unemployment service. So I think that uh, you are also in both these instances always made very aware of your migrant position and then also of your status as a worker within this system. So obviously like the Chamber of Commerce that um, Flavia has already mentioned and Dora has already mentioned, they I mean, there are incredible hierarchies at work in terms of uh, who is self-employed and what private companies are also within this umbrella organization. And there is like this uh, contradiction, of course, that uh, Austria is actually promoting self-employment. So there is this uh, concept of the new self-employed as if it was the, <laughs> I don't know, like the, the new, um, I mean, as if it were a, a recommendable position for somebody doing work, which it is absolutely not. But nevertheless, there is, uh, I don't know, like a lot of uh, uh, promotion uh, going into this. But maybe I, I would perhaps come back to your question regarding also the trade unions. I mean, I think one thing that's missing in Austria very much, and but probably not only in Austria, is more cross-sectoral collaboration. So of course it would be very, um, like uh, it would make a lot of sense, for example, for art workers, cultural workers and care workers to collaborate much more closely as they are tendentially people who will be self-employed and who hold a specific knowledge about this self-employed status but even within the trade union in terms of saisonary uh, you see a, a kind of tendency which is the fact that trade unions are organ uh, i mean they're interested in in mass cases no so that's always the problem that trade union is interested in a level of organization that you first have to reach and i think one of the aspects with migrant work and especially with seasonal work is that this level of organization it's uh, i mean it's an illusion you just simply cannot organize workers who are working in very different countries and living in yet another another one. So I think there is this absolutely this challenge also on a on a transnational level, and the fact that at least in Austria, trade unions function according to the ethos of uh, earlier uh, social democracy. So they are not yet. I mean, they are in a kind of strange delay, which like campaigns such as Cezanneri are kind of trying to bridge this delay. And in trying to enable the trade union to, to recognize that there are migrant seasonal workers who need their support. But, uh, and there I already mentioned this, and this is an experience that actually we share with uh, Flavia on a personal level, this necessity of also having like an anti-racist uh, perspective within the trade union. So you have to deal with migrant workers. You can't expect them to be already a member of the trade union, whereas they're encountering the trade union for the first time. And there is this strange uh, issue also about, which I think is a, a problem of institutionalization, that trade unions actually want to offer services for their members. And, uh, and then it's also the question of what do you expect from such a membership and how do you even so how can such a membership be attractive for seasonal workers and how are they being treated also in this very specific situation of first encounter with the trade union 
And there was one trade unionist who was very involved in the Cezanneri campaign. He is now um, in retirement, but who was also telling us as activists that you love individual cases and the trade union doesn't. So, of course, like what I, th and I think this is actually a, an interesting uh, example that within the Cezanneri campaign, I mean, there are cases where there is collective struggle, but it's uh, also I mean, it's still singular cases of maybe a larger group, but very often it is rather isolated and few people. And in this sense, I find the, the so I'm still kind of concerned with this question, which I don't think we can resolve now, but like the fact how DREPT can self-organize. And I'm always asking myself, what hinders uh, seasonal workers in agriculture of organizing similarly? They have a stronger employment status. They have potentially the trade union. I mean, there is also the Cezanneri campaign, which some workers uh, encounter. But nevertheless, like this degree of self-organization seems to be very difficult to reach. And I'm, 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 I don't have an answer for this, but I'm very interested in what, um, what is possible in one area and less possible in the other area. And what does it depend from because otherwise a lot of the uh, elements are very similar and, and maybe just one small comment because I know that for DREPT it's very important to get out of this self, false self-employment which I think is a very important uh, um, objective of the, of the initiative and at the same time I just wanted to reflect from the Cezanneri perspective that of course within the employment the exploitation is perpetuated so despite the fact that you have all these collective contracts all the labor law theoretically on your side there is a perpetuated exploitation going on and and that's also an interesting question like how to how to yeah how to work against this but we're very excited to fight exploitation from the employment side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I totally <laughs> understand. <laughs> there is obviously a larger uh, condition of migration in uh, Europe that uh, plays into the hierarchy and division of labor in, in uh, the food supply chain. No, if you look to the south of Italy, uh, where there are a lot of uh, migrants from uh, ar arriving in uh, from Africa or uh, southern Spain, where there are big farms, so uh, they are significant part of the European mm -hmm. uh, agricultural economy, and yet there is a huge uh, barrier to migration. So the legalization is there to serve the um, sort of. Uh, uh, degradation of laborers and, and the conditions of work. Um, and uh, those forms of uh, exploitation are, are tolerated because that's what makes agricultural sector competitive. Um, so how do you see, I mean, Austria is a little bit different. No, it's not at the external borders of Europe, but it's at the, it was until recently at the external borders of the European Union. Uh, and there are also historic relations to Eastern Europe, so that makes all these ties uh, through the changes of the regime of migration uh, a bit different. Uh, but uh, how do you see the relations there, the parallels? Is there organizing, if you know, in, uh, in Italy and, and Spain around uh, the same issue? And if there are ties to those uh, uh, initiatives. I mean, from the side of Cezanneri, there are ties and there is a lot of organizing. Maybe one important difference, for example, in Italy, there's a lot of organizing uh, in, um, from like an, an with an anarcho-syndicalist agenda, which I think is very different from the trade union structures that we talk about in uh, in Austria. And I think another difference is, is that uh, many of the migrant people working in, uh, in agriculture in Italy, they are immobilized due to their migration status, so to say. So I think there is this difference that, and that has to do with the organization. I don't want to talk about their status so much, but it creates conditions for organizations where you are 
somewhere on a longer term. It enables you, for example, in terms of the anarcho-syndicalist organizing that we know about uh, in Italy, where there are assemblies happening in different languages depending on the migrant workers involved. I mean, it has a much stronger self-organized uh, character than what, uh, for example, uh, we find in Austria, so to say. I mean, which is... Uh, which also has to do with the fact that workers are in and out of Austria. So it's, uh, in a way, it's maybe even different from the living care workers in the sense that they're also in and out, but they return around the year. And the seasonal workers in agriculture, as I, I mentioned before, might be in Austria for a certain period of months, and then in Poland and the UK for other periods, depending which I think has a lot of uh, impact on the organizing. But maybe just one small side note, which I think has to do with migrant self-organizing across Europe, is, uh, is the fact that, uh, I mean, what I encounter also in the Hungarian community, especially in Austria, since there's quite a big one, and depending on like different, um, like let's say, national communities, uh, if we must, uh, so there are a lot of like these typical Facebook groups, like very often like around specific issues such as travel, such as uh, um, housing, such as uh, work also. And I, I find it an interesting question also how we can use the platform that these groups offer, because these are groups, uh, I mean, Flavia mentioned RET has uh, 10,000 members, over 10,000, which is very significant. And these self-organized like self Facebook groups, they also have like 30, 40,000 members. So it's actually also a platform that with Saisonary we try to use as well in order to share information. But of course, you really have to do a lot of, it's a lot of um, communication work where you really need the language and you need the internal knowledge of these communities, which I think you can do, I can do it with the Hungarian community, Flavia and Dora have this knowledge for the Romanian community, but then I'm also thinking how to make this transnational, because in Austria there are a lot of different migrant groups and for, for instance, it would be also, I think, important within the seasonal work, um, a question as well to to facilitate transnational organizing, which is not so easy. I mean, for language reasons, also very simply. Oh. Oh. Uh, there are some questions from the audience. Uh, so maybe we take uh, a couple of those. Um, and maybe to start with Dora, um, there is a question from Facebook. Uh, uh, Oh, well, I have to say, Valeria has to leave. She has uh, a seven-old son, who, and she needs to attend to him. Um, so, uh, childcare duties call. But uh, so the question to uh, Dora, maybe. So first is one very general and very simple: How can we, as ordinary people, be a help or a hand in this crazy, unjust, and unequal working conditions? And maybe just. Another one to add um, about the visibility, uh, which asks, uh, how does one increase vis visibility and why, for what? Is it enough? What kind of audience does it assume? Who is that sees or who is the addressee, I guess? Is it an imagined middle-class audience that's, that has the power and agency to change social conditions? if only they can be convinced of the suffering of the working class who don't have any power themselves or visibility to other workers. So we see each other overcome isolation and start working together. There is another person from Kaspar, but let's, let's address these two first. Uh, Dora. Uh, the, the first one was to you, no? What can ordinary people do? You have to unmute yourself. Uh, I can give you example from things I have lived. Um, and I'm, I'm telling you very honestly that I have met ordinary people, people who helped me 
me. I had a case where Oma was in the hospital and in at a weekend I had no transport, no bus to the hospital and back. And the ordinary people, the neighbors helped me. They drove me to the hospital and back. This is how ordinary people can help. This is how ordinary people can be there for the Petroirin, for the home nurse care. Uh, to, to, to say hello, to, to recommend her, to talk to her, to, to ask her, do you need something? Um, sh should I, should I, uh, maybe I can come and spend one hour or two hours with your Oma playing. You can go out uh, and um, uh, have a walk. This is how ordinary can can help, and uh, ordinary people can do a lot of things, starting with being humans. This is how they can help, and recommending our uh, um, our um, job and uh, um, trying trying to show that they care because we do care because in our job we cannot do this job without caring. You see, that's all. Thanks. Uh, I would the other like to add about um, visibility too. Too. Just go, go. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to add because I uh, there's this colleague that we have in Dread that always answers uh, this question um, very beautifully. Respect and obviously this is also very important to, to value the work and to value. Uh, the effort and the, the care as a human being and of course all these are all important but Roxana also means um, fair living, uh, fair working conditions so respect as as a worker uh, because care work is work and to respect this as you would respect any other work sector and any other sort of work and this is not really happening right now. The second question was whom the visibility is addressed to. Is it the middle classes uh, or is it other workers? Um, how do you see that? I mean, the terms of that question also, but uh, the answer to that question. Dora, do you want to answer? Flavia, or will you take it? I? Should you answer? Um, yeah, so I think, it's both. I think it's both. Yeah, I think it's both. I think um, our initial plan, like how I said, what DREP is right now was not necessarily our intention. We didn't intend to build up this massive project. So our initial intention was actually um, to build up solidarity between carers. So we wanted to, to um, eliminate this feeling of, of uh, isolation and loneliness and helplessness that every care is alone between four walls and there's nobody there uh, for her or, or him this is this was our initial um, intention yeah to build up this solidarity and to address actually the community we want we were planning to stay within this community borders and then this whole pandemic uh, um, happened and we very quickly realized that um, it doesn't work to stay within the community we can't change the problems within the community without going over these uh, limitations. So now we are directly addressing the political scene. Um, and for that, we need support from the uh, Austrian society. We need support from other uh, similar partners. We need support from NGOs, from activists, from institutions. Um, so we're addressing basically structures informal and formal structures in order to actually put enough pressure on the polit political um, level to to change things because otherwise um, everything stays the same the third question that we got and i guess this goes to katalin um, what can artists and theorists deliver for labor uh, what can an artistic mindset skills etc do for labor and why are artists interested in labor struggles and migration at all? Is it about visibility, which in a way is at the core of artistic practices? Well, I mean, this is a very big question. So I would just kind of maybe uh, stick to 
answering it from my own perspective or what I think <laughs> art and, and also theory can, can do. I mean, I think there is this, uh, so what I mentioned um, earlier, there is this question of discourse and knowledge production. And I do think that uh, artistic uh, projects can have the capacity uh, of intervening in public discourse and maybe in a different way than the media does. So, so what I, I mentioned before, like I think there is this issue of what is our attention span for various uh, struggles, uh, labor struggles and, uh, and also different um, social and political issues because I, I mean there is this, uh, um, I mean there is the reality of us being kind of over flooded, no? Like I think uh, many of us experience this, uh, that there is an overflow of um, information on us in, to a certain extent. Uh, on a lot of uh, political issues, but then you don't, uh, it's difficult to grasp also how, how you can uh, engage with these issues in solidarity, what you can do as an artist, what you can do as an activist. So I think artists would have, in my uh, opinion, a, a responsibility in what kind of knowledge and what kind of uh, discourses they produce about uh, labor issues and also about migration politics and that these should be differentiated and that these should be contributing with perspectives that are not represented, for example, in uh, mainstream media, etc., etc. So, I mean, in general, we like uh, critical uh, perspectives. I mean, from the Saisonary campaign has nothing to do with art per se. Like the, this collaboration that I mentioned was basically the activist campaign sharing knowledge with artists so that they can create this uh, kind of lecture performance. Um, regarding my own practice, uh, which you mentioned in the beginning, Tommy, that I'm working with collaborative practice. So for me, uh, there is a, similar element but of course in a different way like in the way Saisonary is trying to bridge like this uh, I mean distance between uh, workers uh, on the fields and between public discourse but also between trade unions so I think collaborative practices within the arts also have this potential of uh, making connections between different people and different groups and creating possibilities to work like in solidarity with one another. I don't know, like most, most recently we worked with a women's choir in Hungary from a small village. And then of course you can raise a lot of issues related to women's living situations and uh, experiences. Uh, a lot of feminist issues uh, can be addressed across such collaborations, which where I think you encounter perspectives that are not your own and that you might not know or might not be that familiar with, which is extremely important because I think that, uh, I mean, in all fields we have some knowledge, but uh, we, we lack a lot of perspectives because, uh, I mean, because that's just mm -hmm. how it is. I don't know if uh, I, uh, I, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I think in that sense it's really important to, to bridge all these, all these distance and differences also. From the little that I know about your uh, work, you do, do deal with food systems and uh, I would be generally interested in what's your perspective on, on the future uh, within uh, agricultural domain in the sense that countries have experienced now uh, a great risk of food insecurity and that is bound to have knock-on effects on policies, etc., etc. One might be that there is more nationalism around uh, food production. Another one, the other one might be that there is more automation of uh, labor in the farm sector, which is already happening, but this might mm. also be in, in the care sector. It's harder to uh, automize the, the care work, but there is a lot of effort by uh, sort of uh, uh, techno-capitalist uh, forces to do that because obviously the societies in the global north are growing older and uh, it is either transforming the economy to encompass, embrace more care work and give totally different balance to that care work 
or automate it to the greatest degree so as to keep the lab- the cost of labor low. So I don't know, um, that's sort of my take on, on all that, but might be the fallout of the current situation, but how do you see that? Um, maybe I will quickly answer from the, I, I don't, I mean, I don't have an answer to this, what you asked in the first part, Tommy, like how to, what to say about the future of agriculture. I mean, structural change is absolutely needed. I'm mainly dealing with pro-socialist uh, uh, economic uh, situations and rural change in, in Hungary. I mean, in what we didn't talk about, but due to a lot of migrant workers going to Austria and other Western European countries, for example, in Hungary, and I think it might be similar case in uh, Romania, there is a huge problem with lack of workforce in agriculture. And I mean, there are, of course, larger structural problems which have to do with the EU context and also with transnational politics, the fact that small scale producers, it's no secret, like nobody is supporting so small scale producers. So, I mean, we have to um, address the fact like what is the future of industrialized agriculture does it have a future I mean obviously from an ecological and sustainable perspective it doesn't at the same time um, it's so systemic no like the way um, like what you also address with the techno capitalist um, um, current state of affairs that uh, it's uh, very difficult to imagine uh, I mean, we would have to, for example, stop imagining ourselves going to these huge supermarkets every day, no? Like all all, uh, are a lot of, uh, I mean, basic uh, questions around food and livelihood would would need to be uh, addressed. But uh, I think, I mean, one of the issues that I'm really concerned with is difference also across like rural and urban context. And this is also one of my issues in terms of lack of knowledge like lack of knowledge on rural situations, which are not generic, which are not, I mean, which are very uh, diverse and and extremely implicated in uh, political, um, uh, I mean, in politics, like in, especially in rise of right-wing authoritarianism is not only related to rural situations because there would be more support for the right there, but because uh, basically right-wing, uh, governments are uh, extremely uh, instrumentalizing, for example, politics of land, politics of agriculture, and uh, really making it extremely difficult for communities to survive. And I mean, there is, I mean, this leads to kind of maybe explodes a bit the capacities of this discussion. So I will stop now. Sorry, Flavia, I give the word to you and Dora. No worries. I think we have three I mean, minutes I just to want to wrap say, it up. Also, yeah. mm-hmm. Okay, I will be very short then. Um, so I will address also the second part of your uh, question. We know that capitalism feeds on uh, competition and uh, this divide between uh, dividing solidarities and workers. And this is very visible in the care work sector. Um, at the beginning, before we started this movement, there was a lot of competition between the Slovak community and the Romanian community because the Slovak um, community started earlier, they raised the level of the wages and then the Romanians came and then they uh, dropped the wage level for everybody. So of course there was a lot of uh, rage uh, or tension between the communities and this is how capitalism actually works. Um, you know, on one side you have the accumulation of capital and on the other side you have this worker solidarity and they're always um, fighting each other. or. Uh, um, it's a ping pong between between these two, and my hope for the future is that the workers' solidarity um, um, gets strengthened and um, grows, and um, we understand that that the accumulation of capital is not making our lives better, but that we together are, are can do that. Maybe to go back to that question that was asked to Pirate Care, but I'd like to uh, sort of divide it between us. Uh, how do you see uh, technologies, I guess, primarily communication technologies, Facebook, and uh, helping in getting people who are outside of these 
forms of activism on board and how can they get informed? What's, what's your sense? Obviously, you do that. Uh, so if you have any thoughts to that, maybe that uh, will conclude around this. Dora, do you want to address this question? Um, we have no other choice. In, um, all what we uh, we can do is uh, to use technology to 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 stay in touch one with the others because we are scattered all over Austria in all villages in all small uh, uh, towns and so on. We don't we cannot meet because it's pandemia and the only way we can keep in touch we can communicate is facebook is whatsapp is messenger is zoom and we are trying to discover other platforms we can use for us to be together to bring us together we started with whatsapp with messenger with chats we are organizing um, ourselves in facebook groups and facebook communities this is the only way right now for our job in order to stay in contact. This is the only technology. Thank you, Dora. Uh, and we are, we, are, we are trying to help to help other colleagues which are not so, uh, which are a little bit slow with technology. We are trying to help them, to push them, to keep the rhythmus and to be there for us. We are trying to help them how to teach them how to use the email, how to use the internet, how to use, because that means that we are aware that this is, um, uh, this is what we have to do, to keep together, to be solidar one to each other. If, if the politic has no, no heart, has no brain, we have to, to do have heart and brain for politic too. That's my conclusion. <laughs> Great message. Uh, Flavia, Kathleen, maybe some closing words. I don't have anything to add. I think uh, Dora's uh, statement was right on spot. Right. I agree, actually. So I let's agree. Work uh, on I the mean, heart and brain. <laughs> technologies should be there about uh, for uh, struggles around resources, uh, rights, and solidarity. And I think we should approach our use of technology through that or in our time with technology on this. Uh, for us with Pirate Care, it's really uh, how do we learn from others, from those who are organizing, and how do we get involved through that process of learning, or at least have a, a, a greater understanding of what's going on and what is the challenges that organize, organizers face um, and people uh, who kind of struggle for better conditions of care face. Ultimately, in our analysis, we think usually care is taken to be something cuddly and nice. You know, everybody cares about each other and it's so, so humane, but uh, the entire care sector is wrought by inhumanity of the fact that caregivers, care laborers are the ones who receive least care in our society. And that is a fundamental question of the transformation of our societies going forward. You now, if uh, that will radically change, as we spoke about this in, in uh, related to the food uh, sector. So um, I, I propose now you just uh, stay focused on getting yourself informed and getting in touch with those who are organizing. That's that's the sense of technology that we have at Pirate Care. Uh, may, may I add actually one one element? Do because do. It's, I, I, I just was reminded as you talked about care and also about this, uh, about the importance of the possibility of self-care because I think something that we didn't address so directly is the fact that uh, for a lot of people uh, who are working under exploitative working conditions, uh, I mean, how much toll it has on on, uh, on the personal health issues, and we've experienced this particularly in the Saisonary campaign that uh, 
a lot of like also this desolidarizing that I mentioned, uh, the poor workers who stand up for their rights and then at the same time come under a lot of emotional pressure and uh, a lot of, uh, of course, uh, I mean, uh, they are exposed to a lot of health uh, uh, threats, so to say, due, due to the physicality and the exploitative conditions of work. And I think this is something that struck me on the Pirate Care website that like you should receive adequate care in exchange. So like this issue of reciprocity, because at the same time, most of these uh, transnational migrant workers, they're facing the fact that they might have social insurance when they're working, but not when they're not. And many of them don't have access to unemployment benefit, even if they do have unemployment status. For example, this is the case of harvest workers uh, who are working seasonally. And, and these are issues which uh, create conditions in which it's very difficult to live and to care for your well-being. And I think this is something that should also be discussed much more uh, as, uh, as it's an issue. It's, it's, a, it's a huge and often tragic issue. Very much agree um, that is fundamentally you knowing the transformation that needs to happen, well being, but that needs to happen on the grounds of reciprocity and not on the grounds of uh, international division of labor uh, with huge elements of exploitation that are invisibilized also through the border regimes and uh, uh, regimes of migration. Um, we are a bit over time. Uh, I hope we haven't overextended your attention. And <laughs> thanks to everyone for listening in. And big thanks to Dora, Flavia, and Catalin for taking part in, in, in this uh, panel. It was a great panel. I really enjoyed uh, the conversation. So many uh, uh, insights that are close to, to life. Are close to struggles and uh, I hope everybody who listened in or uh, watched this afternoon had sort of uh, the same torrent of, of sparks going on. Um, thank you Inga, thank you Olga. I don't know if you want to say some concluding words. Um, you have the program continuing later. No, um, I mean thank you all for giving us an insight into your work and all the issues around collective organizing and knowledge sharing and organizing solidarity. And also a big thank you to Ranev and Olga for the support. And I hope to see many of you again today and tomorrow for the following live sessions. So bye everyone, ciao. Yeah. Ciao. Thank you so thank much, you. Bye. bye. bye.